the order for morning prayer daily throughout the year. The Lord correct me, but with judgment, not in anger, lest thou bring me to nothing. We say that we have no sin, the truth is not in us. Deceive ourselves. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Dearly beloved brethren, the scripture moveth us in sundry places to acknowledge and confess our manifold sins and wickedness, and that we should not dissemble nor cloak them before the face of Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, but confess them with an humble, lowly, penitent, and obedient heart the end that we may obtain forgiveness of the same by his infinite goodness and mercy. And although we ought at all times humbly to acknowledge our sins before God, yet ought we chiefly so to do when we assemble and meet together to render thanks for the great benefits that we have received at his hands, to set forth his most worthy praise, to hear his most holy word, and to ask those things which are requisite and necessary as well for the body as the soul. Wherefore I pray and beseech you as many as are here present to accompany me with a pure heart and humble voice under the throne of the heavenly grace, saying, Almighty and most merciful Father, we have erred and strayed from thy ways like lost sheep. We have followed too much the devices and desires of our own hearts. We have offended against thy holy laws. We have left undone those things which we ought to have done, and we have done those things that we ought not to have done, and there is no health in us. <clears throat> Spare thou those, O God, who confess their faults. Restore thou those who are penitent, according to thy promises declared unto mankind. In Christ Jesus our Lord, and grant, O most merciful Father, for his sake, that we may hereafter live a godly, righteous, and sober life. To the glory of thy holy name. Amen. The Almighty and everlasting God, who desires not the death of a sinner, but rather that he may turn from his wickedness and live, has given assurance, strength of assurance to those who genuinely repent and unfeignedly believe his, his holy gospel, that he alone directly and immediately absolves and remits the sins of his people. Wherefore, let us ever beseech him to grant us daily repentance and strong saving faith until at length we come to his eternal joy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us heartily rejoice in the strength of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and show ourselves glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In his hand are all the corners of the earth, and the strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands prepared the dry land. O well, come, let us worship, and fall down, and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is the Lord our God, and we are the people of his pasture, and the sheep of his hand. Today, if you will hear his voice, harden not your hearts, as in the provocation, as in the day of temptation, when your fathers tempted me and proved me and saw my works. Forty years long I was grieved with this generation and said, It is a people that do err in their hearts. They have not known my ways. 
and whom I swear in my wrath that they should not enter into my rest. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We continue our work in the book of Psalms. <clears throat> Psalm 2, verse 9. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, and as the vessel of a potter thou shalt dash them to pieces. That's the Psalter verse. Now for Calvin. This is expressly stated to teach us that Christ is furnished with power by which to reign even over those who are averse to his authority and refuse to obey him. The language of David implies that all, not all will voluntarily receive his yoke, but that many will be stiff-necked or necked and rebellious, whom, notwithstanding whom he shall subdue by force and compel to submit to him. It is true the beauty and glory of the kingdom of which David speaks are more illustriously displayed when a willing people run to Christ in the day of his power to show themselves his obedient and loyal subjects. But as the greater part of men rise up against him in violence, which spurns all restraint, it was necessary to add this truth, that this king would prove himself superior to all such opposition. Of this unconquerable power in war, God exhibited a specimen, primarily in the persons of David, person of David, who, as we know, vanquished and overthrew many enemies by force of arms. But the prediction is more fully verified in Christ, who neither by sword nor spear, but by the power of the breath of his mouth, smites the ungodly even to their utter destruction. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. We continue the introduction to the fifth book of the Old Testament. The book of Joshua. He's been giving the outline, has been giving the outline of the book. <clears throat> as well as, this is about the middle of the book. The solemn act of setting up the law in the land of Ebal, Ebal and Gerizim, two mountains. The farther conquest of the land through the subjugation the Gibeonites who had succeeded surreptitiously in obtaining a treaty from Israel which guaranteed their safety, gives the two victories over the allied kings of Canaan in the south in chapter 10, as well as the north, chapter 11, with the capture of the fortified towns of the land. And lastly, at the close of the first, the list is given of all of the conquered kings in chapter 12. The second part commences with the command of God to Joshua to divide the entire land up among the nine, tribe, nine tribes and a half tribe or possession, although several parts of it still remained unconquered. As two tribes and a half had already received from Moses their inheritance, on the eastern side of the Jordan River, the boundaries and towns of which are then described in chapter 13. Accordingly, Joshua, with the heads of the people appointed for that purpose, proceeded to the distribution of the land. First of all, in the camp of Gilgal, where Caleb was first to receive his inheritance. And then according to the lot, the tribes of Judah and Joseph 
Ephraim and the half tribe of Manasseh. And afterwards at Shiloh, where the temple was first of all erected. And a detailed description of the land to be divided was written down. And then the rest of the tribes, Benjamin, Simeon, Zebulun, Issachar, Ashur, Naphtali, Dan, they received their inheritance after which the cities of refuge were selected and 48 cities were given up by the 12 tribes for the Levites to occupy. And finally, the warriors belonging to the tribes beyond Jordan were sent back by Joshua to their inheritance. To this there is appended in the next place an account of what Joshua did towards the end of his life to establish the tribes of Israel securely in their inheritance. An exhortation to the heads of the tribes who were gathered around him to carry out their calling with faithfulness and fidelity and the renewal of the covenant at the Diet of Shechem. This is followed by an account of the close of Joshua's life and the close of the whole book. Thus the two halves of the book correspond exactly to one another. <clears throat> it's the events described in chapter 1 to 5 were preparatory to the conquest of Canaan. So the diets held by Joshua after the distribution of the land by Lot had no other object than to establish the covenant people firmly in the inheritance bestowed upon them by God by exhorting them to be faithful to the Lord. And just as chapter 12 resounds of the first part is a kind of appendix which completes the history of the conquest of the land. So chapter 22 is obviously an appendix to the distribution of the land among the tribes which brings to a close the dismission of the people to the separate portions of the inheritance. <clears throat> Verse 1 of the Te Deum Laudamus. We praise thee, we acknowledge thee to be the Lord. All the earth doth worship thee, the Father everlasting. To thee all angels cry aloud, the heavens and all the powers therein. To thee cherubim continually do cry, Holy, 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 Lord God of Sabaoth, heaven and earth are full of the majesty of thy glory. The glorious company of the apostles praise thee. The goodly fellowship of the prophets praise thee. The noble army of martyrs praise thee. The holy church throughout all the world doth acknowledge thee. The Father of an infinite majesty, thine honorable, true, and only Son, and the Holy Ghost, the Comforter. <clears throat> our second lesson is continue our reflections on the book of Jude, Epistle of Jude, with the help of Matthew Henry. And we're still talking about verses 3 through 7. It's had some good strong things to say about false teachers which we pick up here briefly those who turn the grace of God into lasciviousness are ordained unto condemnation they sin against the last the greatest and most perfect remedy and so are without any excuse those who thus sin as they turn the grace of God into well for now forgiven and as the old John Gerster used to say, Oh, blessed condition, I, I have remission. I can sin as I please and still have remission. That's the idea of antinomianism. Those who make thus a sin must needs die in their wounds, as their disease are of old ordained to this condemnation, whatever expression means. But what if our translators had thought fit to have rendered the words Palai Progegromena of old for written as of persons who uh, through their own sin 
and folly become proper subjects of this condemnation. Plain Christians had not been troubled with dark, doubtful, and perplexing thoughts about reprobation, which the strongest heads cannot far enter into, can bear but little of without much loss and damage. <clears throat> He's talking about the first of these false teachers who are who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. So he's getting ready to maybe treat that idea. It is not enough that early notice was given by inspired writers that such seducers and wicked men should arise in later times, and that, la and that everyone being forewarned should be forearmed against them. Number five, we ought to contend earnestly for the faith in opposition to those who would corrupt or deprave it, such as would have crept in unawares. A wretched character, to be sure, but often very ill applied by weak and ignorant people, and even by those who themselves creep in unawares, who think their ipsit dixit should stand for a law to all their followers and admirers. Surely faithful, humble ministers are helpers of their people's joy, peace, and comfort. They're not lords of their faith. Whoever may attempt to corrupt the faith, we ought to contend earnestly against them. The more busy and crafty the instruments and agents of Satan are to rob us of the truth, the more solicitous should we be to hold it fast, always provided we be very sure that we fasten no wrong, excuse me, no wrong or injurious character on persons, parties, or sentiments. It seems concerned about that dimension, Mr. Henry. Verse 2 of the Tadeum Laudamus. Thou art the King of glory, O Christ. Thou art the everlasting Son of the Father. When thou tookest upon thee to deliver man, thou didst not abhor the virgin's womb. When thou hadst overcome the sharpness of death, thou didst not open the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Thou sittest at the right hand of God in the glory of the Father. We believe that thou shalt come to be our judge. We therefore pray thee, help thy servants, whom thou hast redeemed with thy precious blood. Make them to be numbered with thy saints in glory everlasting. Our fourth lesson is taken from and with Dr. Robert Raymond, specific aspects of the theological task. Talking about systematics here. With the general aspects of the theological task guiding him, the Reformed systematic theologian is specifically responsible to provide his readers with one organized cognitive information that is radically biblical. This is simply what it means to be reformed. Two, to do so in such a way that such information will encourage growth, both in ministerial skills and in specific heart attitudes towards the things of the spirit. The reformed systematician should provide his readers with cognitive information. He's going to talk about other things a little bit later. The major loci and cardinal doctrines of the Christian the of Christian theology are as set forth in Holy Scripture. What he gives his readers should be, with no change in basic content, preachable and teachable material. The historic faith of the early church and the manner in which the church articulated and expressed its faith in such creeds and symbols as the Apostles' Creed, Nicene Creed, 
Niceno, Constantinopolitan Green, the definition of Chalcedon, 451, and also the Athanasian Green. Number three, reform systematician should address the distinctive nature, richness, and beauty of the Reformed faith in teaching the Holy Scripture as interpreted, expounded, and exhibited in John Calvin's Institutes of the Christian Religion and the great national Reformed confessions, such as the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Westminster Assemblies, Catechisms, Larger and Shorter, Number four, Reformed Orthodoxy and its validity as the most viable contemporary expression of scriptural orthodoxy. Five dominant motifs of contemporary theology from the posture of Reformed Biblicism and Confessionalism. Philosophical, number six, philosophical, ideological, and religious themes of contemporary thought where they affect the content of the Christian gospel, construed as including both Christian proclamation and a teaching. And we will pick that up, God willing, tonight. That's our third lesson. We'll pick up verse 3 of the Te Deum. O Lord, save thy people and bless thine heritage. Govern them and lift them up forever. Day by day we magnify thee, and we worship thy name, ever world without end. Vouchsafe, O Lord, to keep us this day without sin. O Lord, have mercy upon us, have mercy upon us. O Lord, let thy mercy lighten upon us as our trust is in thee. O Lord, in thee have I trusted. Let me never be confounded. Well, we are continuing with Dr. Philip Schaff. We're starting on the Swiss Reformation. We're starting here uh, with Ulrich Zwingli, who unfortunately gets bad press from the Anglican world. And it's not quite right, but let's see what Dr. Schaff has to say. Ulrich, or Ulrich Zwingli, was born on January 4, 1484, seven weeks after Luther, in a lowly shepherd's cottage in Weilhaus in the county of Taugenburg, now being in the canton of St. Gall. He descended from the leading family in this retired village. His father, like his grandfather, was the chief magistrate. His mother, the sister of a priest, John Mealy, afterwards abbot of Fischenhausen in Thurgau, 1510 to 1523. His uncle on his father's side, dean of the chapter of Wessen on the wild lake of Wallenstadt. He had seven brothers, he being the third son and two sisters. The village of Wildhaus is the highest in the valley, surrounded by alpine meadows and the lofty mountain scenery of northeastern Switzerland, in the full view of the seven Christ Kirk, Fursten, and snow capped Sentis. The principal industry of the inhabitants was raising flocks. They are described as cheerful, fresh, and energetic people. And these traits we find in Zwingli. The Reformation was introduced there in 1523. Not far distant are the places where Zwingli spent his public life. Glarus, Einsiedeln, Einsiedeln, and Zurich. Zwingli was educated in the Roman Catholic religion by his God-fearing parents and by his uncle, the Dean of Wesson, who favored the new humanistic learning. He grew up a healthy, vigorous boy. He had a very early, he had at a very early age a tender sense of truthfulness as the mother of all virtues. 
and like Washington, he would never tell a lie. When 10 years of age, he was sent to Vesson to a Latin school at Basel and soon excelled in the three chief branches taught there, Latin, grammar, music, and dialectics. We'll pick that up, God willing, tonight. Ulrich Zwingheim. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose again from the dead. <coughs> he ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the, Holy, yeah, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Westminster Shorter Catechism 41. Wherein is the moral law summarily comprehended? The moral law is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. 42. What's the sum of the Ten Commandments? The sum of the Ten Commandments is to love the Lord our God with all our heart, soul, strength, and mind, and our neighbors as ourselves. 43. What's the preface to the Ten Commandments? The preface to the Ten Commandments is in these words. I am the Lord thy God, which hath brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. 44. What doth the preface to the Ten Commandments teach us? The preface to the Ten Commandments teach us that because God is the Lord and our God and our Redeemer, therefore we are bound to keep all his commandments. 45. What's the first commandment? first commandment is, thou shalt have no other gods before me. 46. What's required in the first commandment? The first commandment requireth us to know and acknowledge God to be the only true God and our God, and to worship and glorify him accordingly. 47. What's forbidden in the first commandment? The first commandment forbiddeth the denying or not worshiping and glorifying the true God as God and our God, and the giving of that worship and glory to any other, which is due to him alone. 48. What are we specifically taught by these words before me in the first commandment? These words before me in the first commandment teach us that God, who seeth all things, taketh notice of, is much displeased with, the sin of having any other God. 49. What's the second commandment? The second commandment is, Thou sh shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath, that is in the water beneath the water. Sorry, thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the fathers unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me and showing mercy to thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. What's required in the second commandment? The second commandment requires the receiving, observing, and keeping pure and entire all such religious worship as an ordinance as God has appointed in his word. The Lord be with you. And with thy spirit, let us pray. Lord, have mercy upon us. Christ, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. O Lord, show thy mercy upon us and grant us thy salvation. O Lord, save them that rule and mercifully hear us when we call upon thee. And do thy ministers with righteousness and make thy chosen people joyful. O oh, save thy people and bless thine inheritance. Give peace, O oh Lord, in our time, because there is none other that fighteth for us, but only thou, O oh God. 
O oh God, may clean our hearts within us. And take not thy Holy Spirit from us. O oh Lord, we beseech thee, let thy continual pity cleanse and defend thy church, because it cannot continue in safety without your strength secure. Preserve it evermore by thy help and goodness, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, who art the author of peace and love of concord, in knowledge of whom standeth our eternal life, defend us, thy humble servants, and all assaults of our enemies, that we, surely trusting in thy defense, may not fear the power of any adversaries. Through the might of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day, defend us in the same with thy mighty power. And grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings, being ordered by thy governance, may be righteous in thy sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. O God, the Father of heaven, have mercy upon us, miserable sinners. O God, the Son, Redeemer of the world, have mercy upon us, miserable sinners. O God, the Holy Ghost, proceeding from the Father and the Son, have mercy upon us, miserable sinners. O Holy, blessed, and glorious Trinity, three persons in one God. Have mercy upon us, miserable sinners. Remember not, Lord, our offenses, nor the offenses of our forefathers. Neither take thou vengeance of our sins. Spare us, good Lord. Spare thy people whom thou hast redeemed with thy most precious blood. And be not angry with us forever. Good Lord, deliver us. From all evil and mischief, from sin, from the crafts and assaults of the devil, from thy wrath and from everlasting damnation, good Lord, deliver us. From all blindness of heart, from pride, vain glory, and hypocrisy, from envy, hatred, and malice, and all uncharitableness, good Lord, deliver us. From fornication and all other deadly sins, and from the deceits of the world, the flesh, and the devil, Good Lord, deliver us from lightning and tempest, from plague, pestilence, and famine, from battle and murder, and from sudden death. Good Lord, deliver us from all sedition, privy conspiracy, and rebellion, from all false doctrine, heresy, and schism, from hardness of heart and contempt of thy word and commandment. Good Lord, deliver us. By the mystery of thy holy incarnation, by thy holy nativity and circumcision, by thy baptism, fasting, and temptation, good Lord, deliver us. By thine agony and bloody sweat, by thy cross and passion, by thy precious death and burial, by thy glorious resurrection and ascension, and by the coming of the Holy Ghost, good Lord, deliver us. In all time of our tribulation, in all time of our wealth, in the hour of death and in the day of judgment, good Lord, deliver us. We sinners do beseech thee to hear us, O Lord God, and that it may please thee to rule and govern thy holy church, universal in the right way. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to rule the heart of thy servant and all others in authority that under them we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to be their defender and keeper. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to undo the legislature and ministers of state with grace, wisdom, and understanding. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to bless and keep the judges and magistrates, giving them grace to execute justice and to maintain truth. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. That it may please thee to illuminate all bishops, priests,
priests and deacons with true knowledge and understanding of thy word, that both by their preaching and living they may set it forth and show it forth accordingly. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to bless and keep all thy people. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to give to all nations unity, peace, and concord. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to give us a heart to love and dread thee, and diligently to live after thy commandments. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to give all thy people increase of grace, to hear meekly thy word and to receive it with pure affection and to bring forth the fruits of spirit. Spirit, I beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. It may please thee to bring into the way of truth all such as have erred and are deceived. I beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. That it may please thee to strengthen such as do stand and to comfort and help the weak-hearted and to raise up those who fall, and finally to beat down Satan under our feet. <clears throat> we beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to secure help and comfort all who are in danger, necessity, and tribulation. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to preserve all who travel by land, by water, or by air, all women laboring with child, all sick persons and young children, and to show thy pity upon all prisoners and captives. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to defend and provide for the fatherless children and widows and all who are desolate and oppressed. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to have mercy upon all men. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord, that it may please thee to forgive our enemies, persecutors, and slanderers. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. That it may please thee to give and preserve to our use the kindly fruits of the earth, so that in due time we may enjoy them. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. That it may please thee to give us true repentance, to forgive us all our sins, negligences, and ignorances, and to undo us with the grace of thy Holy Spirit, to amend our lives according to thy holy word. We beseech thee to hear us, good Lord. Son of God, we beseech thee to hear us. O Lamb of God, that takest away the sins of the world, grant us thy peace. O Christ, hear us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. O Lord, deal not with us after our sins, neither reward us according to our infirmities. Let us pray. O God, merciful Father, who despisest not the sighings of a contrite heart, nor the desire of such as are sorrowful, mercifully assist our prayers that we make before thee in all troubles and adversities, whensoever they oppress us, and graciously hear us that those evils which the craft and subtlety of the devil or man worketh against us be brought to naught, and by thy providence and goodness may be dispersed, that we thy servants, being hurt by no persecutions, may evermore give thanks unto thee in thy holy church, through Jesus Christ our Lord. O Lord, arise, help us, and deliver us for thy name's sake. O God, we have heard with our ears, and our fathers have declared unto us the noble works that thou didst in their days, and in old time before them. O Lord, arise, help us, 
and deliver us for thine honor. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. From our enemies, defend us, O Christ. Graciously look upon our afflictions. Pitifully behold the sorrows of our hearts. Mercifully forgive the sins of thy people. Favorably with mercy hear our prayers, O Son of David, have mercy upon us, both now and ever to hear us, O Christ. O Lord, let thy mercy be shown upon us as we do put our trust in thee. <clears throat> we humbly beseech thee, O Father, mercifully to look upon our infirmities and for the glory of thy name turn us from those evils that we most justly have deserved and grant that in all our troubles we may put our whole trust and confidence in thy mercy <clears throat> and evermore serve thee in holiness and pureness of living to thy honor and glory through our only mediator and advocate jesus christ our lord amen almighty god who's given us grace at this time with one accord to make our common supplications unto thee and us promise that when two or three are gathered together in thy name, thou wilt grant their requests. Fulfill now, o Lord, the desires and petitions of thy servants, as may be most expedient for them, granting us in this world knowledge of thy truth, and in the world to come life everlasting. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Ghost be with us all evermore. Amen. Here ends the order for morning prayer and litany throughout the year.